Okay. I think I figured it out. Can you all hear me and see my slides? I hope yes. so. Yes. Thank you. Whew. So, um, for some reason on a Mac computer, sometimes things just uh, have a, a way, uh, there's like a little elf on the backside. So I apologize for that. And thank you for your patience. Um, hello, everyone. Um, this is Alicia Dolce, the Executive Director of the Connecticut Green Building Council. Welcome to today's event, the business case for healthy buildings featuring uh, John McComber, who is a sen senior lecturer for finance at the Harvard Business School. And our session is brought to us by Doug Titus from Tarket Flooring. So we're very thrilled about that. Let me just say a few words about the Connecticut Green Building Council. Our mission is to accelerate the healthy, resilient, equitable, and sustainable transformation of Connecticut's built environment. You know, this year has really been um, sobering for so many of us and has raised our collective attention about the vital role that buildings play in determining occupant health. And so we're thrilled by the opportunity to have John with us today to share his insights. So a couple of um, tips about today's session. This webinar will be recorded and made available on our website. Um, upon entering, everyone has been automatically muted. You can, uh, we invite you to use the chat, uh, send a message to the host if you're experiencing any difficulties participating in this session. Um, as you saw, um, I had a little bit of difficulty. And also uh, use the chat to ask questions or make comments as you think of them. There will be opportunities uh, along the way to, um, for John to field some questions on any of the material he's shown uh, so far. And then at the end, there should be plenty of time. So um, if you've got something on your mind, go ahead and send it in the chat and um, I will be monitoring that. Um, and finally, at the end, John has a hard stop at five, but we are gonna stay on the session. Many of you have the book and have been able to read it and we'll invite you to have an informal book group discussion with us. And now, um, as I said before, the Connecticut Green Building Council is a 501-3C, and as a nonprofit, we really uh, rely on sponsor support in order to provide uh, programming and events such as this. So I just wanna say a huge thank you to Target Flooring. Uh, we have Doug Titus with us today. Target is a global company, um, but Doug is the account manager for the whole New England region, but he happens to be uh, located in Connecticut, which is always nice. Um, and also I, I learned uh, um, about, you know, Doug's, uh, in addition to uh, the role that he serves at Target Flooring, he also spent quite a bit of time in, uh, as a certified facility manager. And in that role, he's extremely familiar with the terrain of decision-making regarding materials that are chosen by building owners. And so we're just really delighted that Doug could join us. Uh, I'm gonna turn this over to Doug and he's going to uh, say a little bit about Tarket's uh, commitment to sustainability as well as introduce John. So take it away, Doug. Thank you very much. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this uh, session focused on putting the building to work for your client, the business case for healthy buildings. And as Alicia said, I'm Doug Titus. I'm the account executive for Tarket North America. And at Tarket, the health and well being of people and planet is one of our top priorities. And this focus really guides the products and, and the designing, the product design and manufacturing practices uh, to help maintain a health and safety for everyone that's interacting with our floors. Tarket's committed to health and well being and follows the cradle to cradle design principles for utilizing healthy materials in our products. People can trust that Tarket offers solutions that are free of hazardous chemicals and contribute to good indoor air quality in these spaces. And as we all know, healthy spaces, uh, healthy indoor spaces is so important because people spend an average of 90% of their lives indoors. And that number actually probably increased, especially this year, given the us all living through this COVID-19 pandemic together. You know, we all work, we as Tarket work closely with the US uh, Green Building Council on a national level. And as Alicia said, we work locally here at the, in Connecticut with the Connecticut Green Building Council because we all share that commitment for healthy buildings and we all wanna do our part. 
So while we all know the value of healthy buildings, we also need to know how to communicate that to shareholders and, and stakeholders effectively. So today we really are honored to have a distinguished guest and expert lead us through uh, the way to do that. We'll be, we will better understand the financial math and positive impacts of healthy buildings for landlords and tenants. And we'll also hear about the foundations of healthy buildings, how smart technology can boost employee performance and the financial business case behind healthy building movements and what it means to your clients, owners, developers, and CFOs. So on behalf of the Connecticut Green Building Council and Tarquette, I'm proud to introduce Pro Professor John McComer, a co-author of the Healthy Buildings, How Indoor Spaces Drive Performance and Productivity. John's a senior lecturer in finance at the Harvard Business School, where he teaches finance, real estate, urbanization, and ent entrepreneurship courses in the MBA elective curriculum and in the executive education program. He is a former chairman and CEO of the George B. H. McComer Company, a large regional general contractor, and remains a principal in several real estate partnerships. His work has appeared in the Harvard, Harvard Business Review, Forbes, the Wall Street Journal Asia, and the Boston Globe. And he's an author of more than 30 case studies on infrastructure projects with particular emphasis on office buildings in the United States, housing in India, water in Mexico, innovative product finance in Africa, private sector-led cities in Asia. And John is also a co-author of the Urban Land Use Institute publication, 10 Principles for Building Resilience. That was built and that was uh, copyrighted in 2018. So with that, I really would like to, it's my, my pleasure to hand the floor over to Professor McComer. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you, Doug. I'm really delighted to be here. And uh, I'd like to work directly with the professionals who are thinking about putting these things together. So this is a lot of fun for me. And um, my past career was as a, a contractor and real estate person. So I like this second career as an academic. So what we're going to do is uh, I'll talk to a little, to a little bit about the, um, the cognition science around indoor air quality, um, sort of pre-COVID. We'll go through some of the numbers and pro formas as deeply or as little as you want. Like I'm a finance professor, I can do these with this kind of cash flows and that stuff if you like. Um, and then we can talk a little bit about getting back to work after COVID. And then I'm aiming to have maybe half an hour, 20 minutes, half an hour at the end to talk. And we're a pretty intimate group. There's about 30 of us. So there's a chance to get a lot of the questions in if you can type them for in the chat for, for Tanya and she'll go from there. So let me show uh, some pictures. I guess it's kind of required in Zoom land. Now, Doug, can you see my uh, first slide here with the uh, putting your building to work for you and the shameless Connecticut uh, chapter USGBC logo? Looking good, John. We see you. Okay, good. Yep. Great, thank you. So the plan is uh, to talk about cognition, as I said, talk about return on investment. Like when is a healthy building justified? It's not always going to have a return on investment. So we have a tenant income statement point of view showing the impacts of increased employee productivity. A landlord pro forma point of view thinking, hmm, if the tenant thinks this way, can they get some more rent? And what I want you to think about is the assumptions, the ranges, and the zones of possible agreement. Because these are all pro forma projections, which in real estate, nobody really knows what the rent's going to be and the vacancy is going to be. So we just look for ranges. What do you have to think it could be? And then uh, we'll segue from that into some post-COVID concepts, even post-vaccine, around who guarantees your building is safe for return, and in particular, some aspects around health performance indicators so that you can indeed show that the building that you're working on is healthy and it's not just something you're promising. And this has a lot to do with these tech items, uh, which are alliterated here as settings, screening, surveys, statistic standards, and sensors. So some of you may be very interested in those aspects of building monitoring as well. And then we hope to be able to talk about all these things. So let's start from here. Here's a chart of uh, outdoor air ventilation rate uh, mapped against indoor air quality. So you can see the outdoor air ventilation rate going down, down, down in the middle part of the last century, particularly around the energy crisis, as people started thinking about, well, worried about how much energy we're spending. And that then led almost directly to the sick building phenomenon. So it led to uh, concepts of, uh, is there too much carbon dioxide? Are people getting Legionnaire's disease? Are they getting off gases from carpets and things like that? And then a concept in ASHRAE of acceptable air quality. 
And part of our premise in the book is acceptable is not acceptable. It's a minimum. And if you're just designing to code, people are going to be sicker than they need to be. So why does this matter? It's part of nine foundations of a healthy building as promulgated by my colleagues at the Harvard uh, T.S. Chan School of Public Health around, uh, air, it's pretty intuitive, air quality, thermal health, like how hot and cold, moisture, dust and pests, safety, security, do you feel healthy in the building, water quality, noise, lighting and views. But the top two, ventilation and air quality are in a sense the hardest because you cannot see them. So the other things you can see, like if you have mice or if you have water, you can see that, but you can't really tell indoor air quality. And the other day, um, we were cooking in our house and cook, put some bacon on, and our indoor air quality monitors went zoink about the particulates in the air. You don't really realize the kind of things that are in the air until you can measure them. So we thought, you know, there really needs to be another uh, better science around the health of the people within the buildings. We had a generation of humanitarian des design ideas underpinned by scientific research. And uh, Joe Allen, my uh, co-author, worked a lot with uh, Norman Foster around multiple designs that he was doing. And so uh, some of his designs also flow forward into the book. And as Doug said, we are the indoor generation. We spend 90% of our time indoors. So there's all these regulations and laws and everything else around outdoor air quality and all this, but you know, not that I want to um, disclose this, but normally we'd ask for a show of hands, but nobody wants to do public math. So I'm 65 years old. That means my indoor age is about 56. I spent about 56 years indoors. So why aren't we thinking about indoor air quality instead of having sick buildings, bad ventilation, that kind of thing? So we started to do empirical research around this to try and quantify what's going on. And here's a picture of an experiment that Joe and his team ran in a research laboratory. And volunteers did, came in for a week and did their regular office work on the upper floor. And the lower floor is piping that goes around and changes the amount of carbon dioxide, the amount of, of PM2.5 particulates, and the level of volatile organic compounds, VOCs, in the space. This is double blind, so the researchers also don't know what the change is. And these people took cognitive tests, short cognitive tests based on a standard from the University of Syracuse, uh, three times a day to see how were they doing on various elements of thinking. So we, all, we knew that people are sort of anecdotally get tired in stuffy conference rooms, or you get sleepy when you get in the airplane, the air's not running and that kind of thing. Or even if you're cooking, you know, it's not the tryptophan in your turkey, it's actually the CO2 in your house that's making you so sleepy. So what were the results? People took cognitive tests across nine functions like basic acuity level, task orientation, crisis response, strategy, the, with these various tests. And what these bars represent is the brown bar with their lower performance in the worst air quality, the green bar with their higher performance in the, uh, in the best air quality. Several standard deviations improved all these people measured against themselves, their own results, not against other people. So very clear empirical results around here, how your cognition is improved. So I saw Joe give this presentation at the Harvard Center for the Environment. And I thought to myself, I'm a real estate guy. I'm missing the boat here because we're busy chasing pennies in energy and getting an attaboy for slowing the fans down and having the building be less comfortable and losing thousands of dollars around performance of people in these buildings. So I set out to think, do we believe this? Can we quantify this? Like what's the order of magnitude? So the idea was to go through and take this work and say, we can't empirically show people are more productive, but we can definitely show empirically improvements in all those tests of cognition that I just showed you. So what would be the impact on a typical uh, thought uh, kind of company like a law firm, engineering firm, architecture firm, private equity firm, consulting firm, something like that. So our baseline assumptions for this company are 40 people, average salary loaded up 75,000. That's kind of low for Connecticut, but it's sort of a national average kind of people. And for a company like this, the payroll is about 30% of revenue. So this company follows the, uh, the 3300, the 33300 uh, rule at JLL, the, the uh, consulting firm uh, put forth around 3% energy, 30% heat, 300 for the payroll. So you think about this in terms of what are these employees costing and look down the left-hand side here, maybe hard to see. The uh, revenue is 6 million, the payroll 3 million, uh, which is about half of the total revenue. The rent's about 300,000 and the utility is about 30,000. So I forget how many square feet they have here. It's about 200 square feet per employee. So the, our premise was 
maybe we're chasing the wrong thing just to be looking at energy. So what if you imagine some improvements in productivity? How would those manifest? And of course, they're not guaranteed. People have a chance to be more productive, but it also depends on motivation, boss, task, all those kind of things. We thought our job is to give people the environment to be most productive that they can. So one of the performers we tried to put forth was saying, what's different if these people are, have a chance to perform better? So in this one, if you think about the tenant's net income, this is a law firm or an accounting firm or a consulting firm, $6 million top line revenue, a little over a million bottom line. So they have a margin of about 15%. So that's in the baseline building. Now imagine, if you will, a healthy building by some measure, generally in our case with uh, primo kind of ventilation. So the level of CO2 were like five or 600 parts per million, not 2000 parts per million. So if you think about the energy impact, they're only paying about $40 a person per year to change the energy and run the fans a little more, change the filters a little more often. It's easily amortized. And if you think, okay, we'll have sick outs would be less by a percent, you know? So somebody who's working 200 days will miss, um, you know, a day or two less of work and productivity boost 2%. They'll write one more article to make, one more sales call. They'll go through one more shop drawing. They'll think of, of one more way to uh, anticipate some aspect in some lawsuit, uh, all of which can turn to revenue. And that's really the holy grail. It's not just cost prevention, but how can we increase the top line? So don't know if these things play out, but it's a very small number to look at considering the cognition numbers that we showed earlier. So what happens here in the next red circle is that the, the OPEX goes up a little bit. It costs a couple thousand dollars to run the fans more. The payroll effect on health is about $30,000 to the good because of lack of sick days. And the productivity boost in this instance is $120,000 if you assume that people are a couple percent more productive. Now, there's an interesting question about who gets the 120. Does the employee get it? Does the boss get it? Does her landlord get it? But well, this means there's a zone of possible agreement where you can negotiate around that difference. If it all accrues to the company, if the people don't get paid anymore, then the, the company that was making a million one now is making a million two on their bottom line because they paid more for energy, but they paid, they benefited from the productivity and lower cost of the employees. So in this case, the Delta from a million one of the $6 million company's bottom line to a million 272 is about 9% of their net income. That's really meaningful. So we thought if these numbers are plausible, can you justify this for various kinds of tenants? And I'll talk about this more later because it kind of depends on what their base rent is, what the salaries are, that kind of stuff. So then we thought, uh, how can we carry this on to think about how buildings can actually make you sick or keep you well? Joe wrote this piece in the New York Times. You've also seen him in the Washington Post and on uh, CNBC and other um, areas about how the buildings really affect what people are up to. So we started thinking about, is this real? And working with Urban Land Institute, as Doug said, we wrote about tenants and investors looking for healthy buildings. This was in June. Of course, now in December, this is clearly playing out in the market. And we wanted to look at this in real life. So we wrote a case study that we call, is the healthiest building in the world worth the rent? They claim to be the healthiest building. We didn't necessarily certify that, but it's about 425 Park Avenue in New York. The first new office building of Park Avenue in about 60 years. And it's designed by and built by l, &L Holdings and designed by Norman Foster. So this is a quite lovely building um, that is, in our case study was called the Tower for the People because so much of it is built around employee health. So we wanted to understand how much more is a landlord paying and how much more do they have to get in rent for this to be worthwhile? So we flipped the uh, pro forma from the tenant point of view to the landlord point of view. And this is what uh, Joe and I teach together in our two classes. I do guest teaching for him at the School of Public Health where the students have to know like what's net present value, what's the cap rate. And he teaches uh, with me at Harvard Business School where students have to know what's CO2, what's volatile organic compound, what's off gassing, that kind of thing. So this is a more complex pro forma. I'm not showing you the whole thing here, but it's a typical stabilized year for a 600,000 square foot multi-tenant building with all kinds of stuff going around, first cost, capital cost, all those kind of things. And at the top, uh, under the red circle here, we are thinking, what would we like to model? We'd like to model 
the ventilation and filtration capacity. And this is blue, which means these are toggles that the students can check, like how much more is it to build premium capacity for ventilation, knowing that the tenant is gonna pay for a lot of tenant improvements, the landlord just has the base job pieces. And how much will it be for healthy building certification? So these are split into landlord op OPEX, landlord CAPEX, and their rent received difference. So we, mo we model these in ranges from like negative 2% to plus, uh, 5%, or in this case, it manifests as 102. There are a bunch of toggles here around the key decisions the landlord had to make at the time of design. One is, are they gonna buy premium ventilation and filtration? The second is, are they gonna certify this as a healthy building, as a well building or fit well or USGBC healthy building? And are they gonna recommission the building annually? which is expensive, but in a sense, you have to recommission the building or it gets out of tune, just like your computer or your car or your guitar gets out of tune, you really have to tune them back up. So the baseline is that there are no healthy building decisions. And so the impact on baseline cash flows is zero. So the basic pro forma is about a $700 million project, which has cash flow and NOI about $72 million a year. So I don't show you that here, it's shown in the baseline model. And we want to look at what's the delta. What's the difference if you make these healthy building decisions? So the baseline is in blue. And here is the every toggle on all healthy. And the way it's modeled here is that we said the landlord is going to pay 2% more CapEx for extra ventilation and filtration capacity, bigger ducts. Maybe they're going to have MER13s or HEPA filters. Maybe they're going to have ultraviolet uh, radiation or something like that. And they're gonna pay um, a lot for a healthy building certification um, because it's not just the cost to get the building certified. What else do you have to spend in order to make it certifiable, just like LEED? So there might be a LEED professional thinking about the, the, um, the rating system, but you also have to actually put the work in place to get the rating. Then we thought, what's the landlord OPEX impact and what's their rent received impact? So you have to think, okay, what do we believe here? So in this model, the landlord told us, yeah, it's maybe 2% of base building cost to increase this um, uh, building for more capacity and another 3% to make it certifiable for well or fit well or something like that. It's 5% more base building cost. Almost no operating impact because they're gonna pass it all through the tenant in this, this particular iteration of this model. And the rent received, we modeled it 104%, saying the tenant will pay 4% more rent because they believe this space is healthier. Now, this is a big thing to test in the marketplace. This is what we're gonna see right now. But the way this plays out is that with these cost and rent multipliers, all these decisions toggled on, now the students can play with all this with different multipliers, different toggles. With these decisions, all oh, yes, then these are the impacts on the pro forma. So with the additional uh, healthy building modeling, the net operating income each year as a landlord is about five and a half million dollars net of the cost that they spent. So how do you think that this is worthwhile? The one-time cap tax is 12. The year-by-year -year OPEX is 3.5. The rent increment in this particular run is 9.3. So you take the 9.3 in rent, less the 3.5 in OPEX, that's $5.8 million a year in rent. And there was a one-time CapEx hit of $12 million. So 5 million on 12% is about a 47% cash on cost year over year return. Um, in a stabilized year, not counting time value of money and all that stuff. So this is the zone where you can then start to argue. You can say, I don't believe they're gonna get 4%. Okay, model 2%. I don't believe you can do this for, for 5%, it's gonna be more. I think I can do it cheaper because I have better engineers and the, uh, the equipment is coming faster, then you can model that differently. So what we're looking for is a zone of possible agreement here to show why this is worthwhile. Now, what this landlord wound up saying was, uh, at the time the building was built, it was under great demand, and they thought the people are going to rent this building are going to pay $150 a square foot. They're going to want the a healthy building that their employees believe is a healthy building. So there's daylight and there's other aspects. In a sense, it's almost like another amenity, like it's hard to value. But they thought we are going to be able to actually charge premium rent, all else equal. What they're finding now in the market is they may not be able to charge premium rent, but as people come back to work, they're of course in post COVID obsessed with is the building healthy. So what this landlord believes they're gonna do is maybe not get more uh, face value rent, but they're gonna improve their occupancy, uh, have less vacancy. And that's just the same in a pro forma to increase your occupancy rate, reduce your vacancy rate as having an increase in the rental price. So that's what they're determining right now is this 
uh, building us out in the market and uh, being rented. So let me stop here. I've talked really fast. I've been through performance. Uh, the idea of the workshop is to talk about the return on investment. So normally I just blow through this and say, you know, talk to me later. But if uh, some of you want to talk about either of these performance right now, then uh, type into the chat and uh, Alicia will, will find that question and ask me. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, actually, we did get a question. Uh, when you showed the first pro forma, um, the, the question really was, uh, I had to do with retrofits, essentially. And, um, you know, what about retrofits? Does, does the, the math still work? Or do you have to factor in cost uh, in a different fashion? So maybe you could speak a little bit to, to that aspect. Sure. And a lot of you have experience around retrofits as well. Thank you. Um, happily, the big news on retrofits really is just run the fans, open the windows if you can. So this is advice that Joe and I are giving everywhere to offices and schools and everybody else, because it turns out that um, ventilation is what's important, both pre-COVID thinking about cognition and certainly in COVID time, because it's been shown that COVID is mostly transferred through aerosols, not so much droplets, not too much for the fomites, which is the stuff that's on your packages and your desks. So um, happily, running the fans more, changing the filters more addresses a lot of these health issues in many, many buildings. If you're looking to really upgrade, like to change from MERV filters to HEPA filters, now you're gonna crush your ductwork because the pressure drops. So now it's really expensive to retrofit that. Or if you don't have operable windows. So if you look right now at uh, like a commercial observer webinar or something like that, buildings that are starting to trade in New York, if you have a, you know, a 60 story building with non-operable windows and an undersized mechanical system and a few cramped little elevators, these buildings are plummeting in value. Then you have the secondary question of what about smaller uh, places out in the B and C uh, areas? So the, the 425 Park Avenue uh, building has like $175 net rents. If you have, you know, 30,000 square feet in, you know, in, in, uh, in upstate New York, where you're only getting, we have like, you know, two lawyers and, and two doctors and, and, the, and the doctors haven't paid their rent in three months and they're only paying $15 anyway. That's a lot different. You're not going to go spend $5 a square foot an energy upgrade. So ultimately, I think as a real estate guy that this down cycle is gonna flush out bad properties like every down cycle does. There'll be poorly ventilated hotels that never come back. There'll be poorly, vent hard to ventilate office buildings where somebody will blow out some windows and turn it into housing or something like that. But the really good buildings will survive. So in a sense, the 425 people have future-proofed that. So when you're talking with clients about retrofit, actually, I'll talk about some other COVID things in a moment, but the ventilation is the key thing more than, in our, in our view, more than the ionization or the uh, ultraviolet and those kind of things. Thanks. I don't see any, um, I haven't seen any new, yep, I, um, I don't see any new questions. So um, I guess we can go ahead and, and move on. Everybody's ready for the test about the numbers? Good. <laughs> Yeah, every, everyone's memorized them, John. So, well, you know, you guys said this is going to be rigorous workshops. So I said, okay, I got to get my performance out. Um, you know, with my MBA students, I do this with live spreadsheets, but, I th but that breaks so often, I thought I'm not going to risk it here. So we talked a little bit about cognition pre-COVID. We talked about the economic, all the numbers I just showed you are pre-COVID. So if you think about the downside of health, it's way farther down than somebody missing two days with a cold. Like if you have an employee on a ventilator for three weeks, that's expensive. Um, so, uh, and you know, grim and not even something to, to talk lightly about. So how do you get back to work? This kind of addresses some of the concerns of the ventilation question. So Joe and I wrote this piece in Harvard Business Review using this idea of a hierarchy of controls. So if you think about the hierarchy, like a hierarchy of needs or a housing pyramid, at the bottom of this uh, triangle are the things that are the most effective, that's why they're the widest. They also are the most expensive, that's why they're at the bottom. So elimination of exposure, this is the total lockdown scheme. It works, lockdowns work from a health point of view. They're terrible from an economy point of view, they're really expensive they're, and you know, people are going broke all over uh, the world because of these lockdowns. So you gotta step up. The next area on the triangle is less effective but also less costly where you have substitution of activities meaning the people who can do it work from home and the essential workers come to work, whether the doctors and nurses or um, people in meatpacking plant or people driving buses and those kind of things. 
The next one is the one that a lot of you are interested in is engineering controls and spaces. So these are physical things. So these are aspects like the fan speed, like the filters, like um, the air changes per hour, like the humidity. Uh, COVID doesn't like humidity. So running buildings a little more humid uh, seems to help from the COVID point Joe? of view. Yeah. Hey, Joe, my name's Randy. I'm with a company. So somebody has to go on mute hey, or Randy, else we're having a, uh, I yeah. I yeah. Just a very quick question. Uh, my Good to see you, Randy. Randy. <laughs> Um, you know, he might have been about to reveal the secrets of the universe. So as you continue up on the administrative controls, these are the things that companies do, like we're going to have half the workforce on Monday, half the workforce on Tuesday. We're going to have people six feet apart. We're going to have plexiglass between you and all this. So these are things that you do that they are less expensive. That they're, a lot of them are less effective, but everybody has some combination of what works. And top is the PPEs. So the PPEs, the masks work. They don't work as well as lockdowns, but they're a hell of a lot less damaging to the economy and to people's psychology than having the mask. So every situation uh, varies with respect to retrofits. Do you go in, if you have a lot, if you're a well-capitalized landlord with a really expensive building and a lot of staff who can do this stuff, those people tend to go more towards the, um, the engineering controls. Like they have touchless uh, entries have all been retrofitted and there's a bigger elevator cab in their new building and there's plexiglass everywhere and they are doing health theater, you know, having ionization all over the place. The ones with less uh, capital money tend to have the administrative controls. That's where you see let smaller landlords or hotels or retail take your temperature on their way in, only three people in the store every time, those kind of things, because they're less expensive in the short run to implement. So uh, everything's a balance and it depends on what the community spread is in your a particular area. So along this uh, hierarchy is where the, the sweet spot is of things to be done. So who guarantees your workplace is actually safe? Well, the short answer is nobody guarantees your workplace is safe. Nobody's out there from the government or the USGBC or the ASHRAE or the insurance company or anybody. So there are people coming back to work or supposed to come back to cruise ships or airplanes or hotels or, or restaurants and they claim to be safe just because somebody claims it. So I get three emails a day from United, Delta, and American telling me how safe their planes are and I should come and I get them from Marriott and everybody else too. But you know, there's no really substantiation for that, but it can be done. So uh, Joe and I introduced in the book, the concept of health performance indicators. These are like the key performance indicators that a lot of you use in businesses to see is the business actually on track. And like everything, there are leading indicators and lagging indicators. In this particular diagram, the ones above the line have to do with the people. The ones below the line have to do with the building. So they're indirect. It happens that the building is a lot easier to measure. Buildings are inanimate and we can measure leading indicators like what is the ventilation design? Um, are we doing continuous commissioning? We can measure lagging indicators like what are the particulates? What are the volatile organic compounds? What's the humidity? So we tend to measure stuff in buildings, partly because we're engineer geeks and partly because it's easy to do. Think about the people. The leading indicators can include what's your temperature. They can include, do we feel optimistic about coming to the office? So there's surveys and things like that. And a lot of stuff that can be collected from personal devices. Like for me to go into a Harvard building, I have to go through and fill out this survey about, do you have COVID? Have you been with somebody have COVID? You've read about COVID, that kind of thing. The lagging indicators on people are pretty easy to tell, like how many sick days were there? Um, are the people complaining about their office? Are they having headaches? Those kind of things. So these all can be measured in terms of what are we looking at in the people and in the structure and how do we do? So there can be a dashboard essentially. And the dashboard is put together with these six components. And they use health performance indicators to reduce the risk in opening up and essentially have somebody believe your guarantee. Because what gets measured gets done. So the first is pretty obvious, it's around settings. So what is the airflow? So I'm not a commercial landlord anymore, I have been, but I would have a, dash, a, a you know, live dashboard right up front saying, here's how many air changes an hour, here's how many CFM, and here's what we're doing for filtration, and here's the last time we changed the filters. These are settings you can physically look at. Similarly, there's all kinds of sensors you can be thinking about in the building around the things, the natural things like temperature and humidity, also organic, volatile organic compounds, particulates, and CO2 are, are the, you know, the, the ones that are looked at the most. We can't measure right now for COVID in the air, but it turns out that um, all those ventilation factors are pretty good proxy for how well was the building um, um, cleaned out. There's also sensors in people. So this exists on multiple levels. You can take people's temperature. You can measure the air in their office as they're breathing. 
uh, your Apple iPhone 6 has a pulse oximeter in it. So if you wanted to, you could tie your indoor air quality monitor to your Fitbit or your, your pulse oximeter and put all that information out in the cloud so somebody could process that. I personally I don't know of an era that I worry about the privacy aspects. Screening is something that's natural uh, around buildings. Like, have you had the swab test? Have you had the PCR test? Uh, what's your skin temperature? Have you seen all the stuff? So everybody is screening who can come in, who cannot, and that could be that data can be tracked. Similarly, there are surveys around not only have you been exposed, but is your coworker coughing on you? Are you finding that you're comfortable in the elevator or in the washroom? Are you are people wearing masks to get off the airplane? They say were people masked appropriately? Was the you know, were the flight attendants doing these kind of things? Statistics are obviously what tracks all this, and everything that's talked about above is available as time series type information. So if you were the, the, the insurance company or the mortgage company or the landlord or the tenant company or one of the employees, you could imagine doing this. You can even imagine sending your kid off to school with a, a handheld portable air quality monitor. If you go on any electronics website now, there were a couple of dozen portable indoor air quality monitors between 100 and 300 dollars, many of which are are handheld, um, so you can measure these kind of things. I don't have school age kids anymore, but I would think about sending them off with some of these things. And finally, standards. There really isn't a standard at the moment. ASHRAE is inadequate. Well and fit well are new, and they're one-time things like LEED used to be, where the, lead, the building is LEED certified on the drawings, but nobody looks five years later to see if the bike rack is there and the filtration works and, and all this kind of stuff. So these are the things that people who are listening on this call should be promulgating, in my view, for uh, employees, or if you're a building product manufacturer, I did this um, same a similar presentation for Siemens that you know, who make all the devices and also air quality monitors. Uh, this is the kind of thing that they're thinking about going forward. So uh, we've sort of proceeded from cognition that you do better in a healthy building to, okay, what are the economics? When is this justified? It's not always justified into how do you think about it in a big building and then into post COVID, how do we come back? So finally, for a lot of uh, both office employers, but also you think about apartment buildings and retail in particular. Uh, on the left, these are uh, actual quotes we got from Glassdoor. Uh, this is a negative one on the left. Coronavirus is finally showing the company how flawed it is with outdated technology and management style. What's the point of having 3,000 people in an office with circulated air? How is this different than being on a virus-infected cruise ship eight days a week? You and your clients don't really want your employees saying this, particularly as it gets to be harder and harder to get people to come back. On the right-hand side, management has taken the lead in handling the COVID-19 situation with health and safety of its entire workforce of the utmost importance. For example, showing those dashboard items. In the face of the current situation, I couldn't be happier with how this entire company is responding. That's valuable, particularly when you're trying to get people to come in, have them be comfortable, have them do their best work. So this is the kind of, of uh, effort that Joe and I are interested in promulgating in buildings. And I'm delighted to uh, take questions or discuss this uh, with you. Uh, thanks, John. Um, again, we um, had a, a, two questions, and one of them has, is very specific and has to do with retrofits. But um, let me hold off on that one and, and return to something that you actually mentioned earlier, which is the possibility of, of office buildings possibly being converted to housing. And, and actually, that was one of the questions you know, that um, read that many office buildings will possibly be converted to housing, say in New York. But um, I think the big question is, you know, how does, how do these financial models and the assumptions that are made really translate to, to housing? And, and to build on that, you know, while people were um, uh, waiting to get on the, into the session, you know, John and I talked a little bit about affordable housing, for example, which is again, a, a very unique uh, a, a neat type of housing. And I know there's a lot of people on the, in this session who, who specialize in affordable housing. So maybe you could just talk a little bit about that aspect. Sure, I'll talk a little bit about uh, specifically the capital cost to make some of these improvements. So um, probably the, the, the most painful example is in New York where in the outer boroughs in, in uh, Brooklyn and Queens in particular, actually in Boston, um, in Chelsea, and in, in uh, Lawrence, and uh, in New Bedford, um, some of this very dense housing is, has been really uh, dangerous, and a lot of people have been very sick. So uh, a lot of the people in public housing or low-income housing are living in situations where 
the building doesn't follow any of the nine foundations of a healthy building and it's drafty and it's dangerous and it's not well ventilated. So what happens? People can't, don't have any choice. They're living multiple people to a room and they have to go to work. They have the kind of jobs where they can't miss a paycheck. So they're on the bus, they're on the subway being exposed to these things more. And that's who disproportionately has gotten sick in the Northeast. So most of these people, um, if they're in public housing, they're not on a big insurance program. The city is paying for them. So the city of New York is paying for a lot of lower income people to come to the hospital to be on ventilators or to get buried, even worse, when it's pretty easy to argue that had they spent this, the same pocket, city of New York spent the money up front and making these buildings healthier and cleaning the subways and the buses, these people would have been sick at a much lower rate to begin with. So then the question becomes, how do you get a very siloed organization like a big um, city to recognize that the person over here is getting an attaboy for spending as little money as possible in the housing should have something to do with the person over here who's in the, the emergency room for people without insurance um, you know, trying to get them intubated. Um, that ought to come together. I think in the private sector, this financing is going to start coming from insurance companies. So if you think about the green building space 10 years ago, a lot of talk about energy efficiency finance, when their low hanging fruit was still there, when you could change out your light bulbs from incandescent to, to halon and now to, to halide and then now to LEDs, or when there's insulation, there were companies like Amoresco or Interlock would come out and or Johnson Controls will still do it, come out and do the capital cost and get paid by the savings. The savings, the avoided costs are much greater in COVID time from making the building healthy. So I think it makes sense for big organizations that have some uh, that have contracts with like CBS Atno or somebody like that to say, let's have that entity finance this upfront renovation. Because it's very difficult for most landlords to say, okay, I'm gonna just gonna spend more capital money and not collect any more rent. Like you can't do that if it's in a housing situation, but you can think of those avoided um, costs and think of who are the other payers. And to me, this is a way to engage uh, the people with the real money, which are the health insurance companies. Okay. Yeah, no, it, it's definitely a, a, a complex array of stakeholders when you when you shift over to public housing. So, uh, so that that's a, that's an interesting perspective. Um, the, a couple of other questions have to do is um, how big is the market for forward-looking renters that will pay extra rent for a better building? You know, I get, and then the the, the uh, as Anthony Law says, is this an enlightened niche? You know, niche. So I guess in some ways, you know, to what degree do you see, you, know, you touched on this earlier. Um, do you think this is, you know, how big is the market? What's the demand gonna be like? So I think there are two big unknowns that we haven't uh, figured out yet. So I draw this as a, as a two by two of scenarios. One is essentially um, how long will it take to really get COVID under control? You know, yes, maybe some people got vaccines today, but the whole population hasn't been vaccinated. We don't know how long the vaccine is going to work or who's going to take it. So we might get this all wrapped up by summertime or COVID might be here with us forever, like malaria, dengue, yellow fever, and you can get it again. That would really change people's ideas about density. Similarly, even after this wave goes away, will people then forget about public health or is this going to accelerate people's thinking about health going forward and then start to look at ventilation and other aspects of healthy buildings. So when we wrote the book initially pre-COVID, we thought this evidence is so compelling. The question is how long will it take to percolate through the industry? Like when I came in this industry, built up asphalt rubber roofs, uh, built up asphalt roofs, tar and gravel, where the standard and rubber roofs membranes were this radical new thing. And it took a long time to persuade people that a membrane would work and that you could get it guaranteed by these big deep pockets like like uh, Goodyear and um, Carlisle. And then after 30 years, it percolated out. Like, you know, elevators and fire protection took 30 years to percolate through the industry. So even pre-COVID, we think that the healthy building ideas are gonna be in people's minds. And this is the health first generation anyway, even before COVID and more so now. So the, the second question around the, the, um, these buildings is around whether people are gonna be happy doing what we're doing right now. So this ability to work together online has really changed and accelerated probably also another 20 years of awareness and comfort working this way. So I went to Africa twice this, Jan this past January. Now I'm not gonna have to go to Africa twice in a month um, again. So that will change both 
people's interest in the, the urban core and it will it'll change for people with a choice, it'll change housing demands. Cause I said, I need a bigger house cause I need to have a, a Zoom studio or a Teams studio or a, or a Hangouts studio forever. So uh, there's, you know, like everything, there's sort of winners and losers and, and that will, will play out. But I also think there's gonna be a pretty big real estate recession going forward. Everybody's been kind of holding their breath about the foreclosures and the defaults and the, the negligence suits and, and all this kind of stuff. But eventually that's gonna percolate through and it'll be another cycle. Um, so I think all, personally, I think all those things are gonna shake out. So like they always do, the best buildings are gonna do well and the worst buildings are gonna do poorly. And that definitely makes sense. Um, someone else asked another question about building retrofits, and it's actually pretty specific. They asked um, if you have an opinion on bipolar ionization for building retrofits. Yeah, uh, the, the the opinion is that um, there are a lot of unintended consequences with bipolar ionization. It's relatively new. It doesn't necessarily get the virus you're trying to get, but also can create other gases, notably ozone, that are worse. So for Joe and I don't recommend that particular uh, uh, technology. I mean, there's a lot of people out there selling and pushing it and in certain aspects that makes sense. But you know, it's weird being in the Northeast because we're with all these science people and all these engineers and everybody wants to have a you know, intellectually defensible, intellectual capital defensible, you know, scalable investment. Um, our argument is that for the same money, thinking harder about the ventilation and harder about the masks and harder about the surveys is a better return and you have fewer unintended consequences. Another unintended consequence is with all this cleaning, 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 now you, you, A, you kill the good bacteria and B, there's all these new solvents in the air. You might be introducing solvents that you didn't think were gonna be there in those quantities. Like Lysol never said, you know, put Lysol and, you know, bleach on your countertop five times a day and then, and then yeah. breathe it, you know. So there's, there's a lot of sort of unintended consequences around um, trying to, to make a big, bold move that everybody sees. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's definitely, uh, that, that's definitely interesting. Um, someone else just asked, what are the, impl uh, Paul Keyes asked, what are the implications on property and casualty insurers? if their clients don't, oh, this is, if their clients don't improve the health of their buildings. Is anyone looking at that angle? Not yet, but they will. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's lots of questions. Well, it's a question in the stimulus package right now about um, having relief for corporations around some of the COVID liabilities. It's really not clear. Uh, if somebody says, well, I got COVID because I was in your building, it's hard to track that you got it that way. If I'm thinking like a property casualty company, if I'm Travelers or Aetna or, or a reinsurance company, I'm absolutely looking at that going forward. And I'm looking at least for some of these health performance indicators. It's not clear um, you know, if business interruption insurance applies to this or not. All this stuff has been kind of put in suspended animation for a while. Mm. So it wouldn't surprise me if like a lot of things, ultimately, some of these healthy building aspects are driven by banks and insurance companies who don't want the risk that somebody says, you were lazy, you didn't change the filters, there was Legionnaire's disease in the corridor mm -hmm. and there was mold um, in the VAV box and that's how come I get sick and I can prove it because I have my Apple Watch and my indoor air quality monitor that was in my office. So I, I think that's a very prescient question. We don't know the answer, but I, I would not just sort of you know hide from that, that exposure, that yeah. potential exposure. Yeah. It yeah, and insurance is arguably going to play a much larger role. Uh, as, as, you know, building health and also um, climate change. You know, buildings at risk for climate change and more direct climate change impacts. Um, we're just about uh, out of time. I know you have to. Um, you've got to uh, to leave around five, and we're about five minutes before then. Um, I'm looking through the chat, and I think I've got all the questions. Although I see one more um, about uh, operable windows specifically in multifamily housing. And the, the, the uh, Steve Hall wonders, uh, like why, why are operable windows allowed? I assume this by code for multifamily housing. Um, do, you have a, do you have an opinion on that or? Why are they allowed? Are well, they that's, required? Steve, feel free to unmute yourself if you, uh, I'm reading your question as, as, it's, as it's typed, but if, I, uh, if I'm, if I misunderstand the intent. I'm trying to 
You said why? Yeah, why? We, yeah. We, uh, I'm doing a project in <clears throat> in the in uh, Portchester, New York, and the engineers are saying, "Well, we don't really have to go to the expense of ducted uh, supply and return because we're by code we're allowed to just have operable windows." And I'm saying to myself, "It just doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever." Somebody on the 10th floor, if they feel stuffy, you're going to open the window. I mean, what, what is it? What kind of ventilation is that? Mm. Well, it's better than being closed, but that sounds like a shortcut to me. Um, because most of the time, like maybe you have your open, windows open sometime, or if you have a, you know, in my house, if I burn something on the stove, I open the windows. But th these, these buildings need to have a reliable return and supply that's conditioned all year. Um, so having you rely, it's not. It's nice to be able to open your windows, but it's really kind of strange to rely on all your neighbors to balance the building. Um, so I, that doesn't seem like a good idea to me. It seems like operable windows is a good idea, but I don't think they can cheap out on the base building systems. Right. Steve, you're still muted. Did you, if you had, if you have a reply, yeah, just unmute for a moment. I just, I, all I'm saying is that the, the New York State Code, and I think perhaps even the Connecticut, and the Connecticut Code says, oh, yes, that, that's perfectly fine. You, that, that, can be, that can be your ventilation for the whole building. Yeah, it might be a question of, of how many units and how tall the building is and that kind of thing, too. Yeah. Okay, great. All right. Um, I put a, out a, a last call for questions. Um, and we're at 459. So uh, we did we did well. Like you got through your material and uh, showed us some numbers and uh, threw out some new ideas. Um, any any last anybody's got any last comments? Uh, they want to uh, share that. Feel free. We'll hang out here for a couple more minutes. And of course, we're we're going to stay on if anybody wants to uh, talk a bit about the book. So that's, I found the book, I think so, like I said, I found the I'm book. I'm gonna really head out because I'm, I'm on a uh, hospital, uh, I'm a trustee of a hospital. Yeah. And we're trying to figure out what units we're gonna close down so we can reopen for COVID. So I need to go be in this meeting. <laughs> um, but um, thank you all for your time. I see there's as many people at the end as the beginning, which is nice, that doesn't always happen. Yeah. And thanks for really good questions. And I enjoyed working with you all. Thank you so much, John. Take thank care. Bye-bye. All right. Okay. So again, anybody who wants to stay on the line or chat about uh, has had a chance to read the book and wants to chat a little bit about that, we'll stay on. Or if not, uh, you're welcome to also exit the session. Hey, Alicia, this is Melissa. Yes. I have, Hi, not, Melissa. I have not read the book. But I did want people to know that there are standards out there now for um, uh, COVID safety that are specifically geared towards COVID safety. There's one from LEED or ASGBC that's ARC. There's one from FitWell that's um, viral response. There's, um, there's one from, um, uh, I can't remember, NIOSH or something like that. Um, that's like really an OSHA based standard. Um, so there are a few out there, they're very novel. Um, mm. And uh, if anybody was interested in um, actually certifying for COVID, there are options. Yeah. And yeah, and I think, um, I think that's, it, that's good to know. I mean, I think what I heard John say is when they, they started, you know, they, they launched into this book project, it was before the world of COVID. And of course, everything changed pretty dramatically after uh, the book was published, which is you know why they're both in such high demand, particularly Joe, because he he covers the public health side of, of the equation, so to speak. But the part that I found interesting, you know, just you know, hearing him sort of speak, and um, and and it's not necessarily covered in the book per se, but this idea that you know at this point nobody is really guaranteeing. Uh, that these buildings are in fact safe to return to. So it, it sounds like a bit of the, it's voluntary and a bit of the wild west, you know, in terms of, and I think it's a situation where the more you know, the more you can, um, the more you can advocate, you know, for, for the safety. And, and that's one of the things I heard actually Joe Allen saying was that, you know, with the advent of like social media, 
um, people are much more likely to sort of um, um, out a sick building. And it was like, well, that's such a new phenomenon because I don't think in the past people were necessarily thinking about the condition of their building and how safe it was to be inside. So um, I'm sure more will, um, more will unfold. To that point, Alicia, this is Chris Cooperine. Um, we saw John McComer speak. He was one of our previous awards presenters. And something that's been going on a lot in New York City recently is actually putting in more or less these nutrition fact style boards on the buildings themselves to talk about energy issues. And I'm very interested and curious to see if we're going to start adapting a very similar mentality towards indoor air quality. Are we going to start putting physical lab labels on doors um, or building fronts in order for people to understand what goes into it? How is it operated? What are the standards? And especially now in the age of COVID, what is my personal risk level for entering your building? Yeah. No, I think that's very true. Yeah, I think risk level is the right way to think about it because like you said, there's no way to guarantee that something is safe. It's always less risky than something else. Um, so understanding understanding that is, is key. And I, I love the idea of indoor air quality monitors and like having a rating or actually just having like on the, maybe as you walk in, you can see the indoor air quality real time and decide yeah. whether or not you wanna walk into that building. Yeah, I think that this is a really good time to be in the business of indoor air quality monitors. Um, I, and I thought it was interesting, no one commented on it, but I thought his, his suggestion about, you know, if I had school age children, I would, um, I'd equip them with a handheld monitor. Is that yours, Melissa? Is that, are you showing us your desk? You're muted, Melissa. Yeah, is that must be your desk monitor. What? Sorry, yeah, that was my personal air quality monitor. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> I also then wonder, kind of in conjunction with this, if we know that we are for sure going to have to allow a lot more air into these buildings, I think of densely urban areas or areas like Connecticut that in general has poor outdoor air quality. Right. If there's going to be a, a coinciding um, adoption, uh, adoption of more rigorous idling laws or parking restrictions or some of these other things that, that are allowed outside, but we know that they are now coming in. So if you've got a busy street with a loading yeah. dock in, in a city that's right next to the air intake of a large multifamily building, is it now going to, is there going to be enough pressure now to say that, you know, cars need to be either more mandated or restricted or New York City, for example, really does have a three minute uh, limit on idling. The New York City chapter of the International Society of Sustainability Professionals have had a somebody who is um, very prominent in that field present recently. And it it's, really does make us wonder and start to think systemically at how do how does what happens outside affect us inside? Absolutely. So it's not very well known, but Connecticut as a state has a three minute idling law. Mm -hmm. I don't think people know that as much. Mm -hmm. I have gone to, if I've seen a truck idling more than three minutes outside my office where I like to open the windows when it's nice out, um, I have gone up to them and said, hey, you can't do this. And you're preventing me from being able to open my windows and have fresh air. So I think that we need to maybe make people more aware of the fact that it's illegal mm -hmm. in Connecticut. That's interesting. We um, have a house that has HEPA quality fresh air in it 24 hours a day. And when we change the air filters every quarter, the particulate on it is literally black because I'm sandwiched between the train and 95 and a street on either side. And the amount of, of black that just goes in a MERV 8 filter, which is the pre filter before the HEPA filter, is shocking. And that's what you breathe every day when you're outside. Yeah, that's, that's true. It's when you, it's, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. And when you see that air filter, it's like, oh my gosh. Yeah. And I, I also don't know that people, you know, people 
don't, not everyone realizes that, you know, the uh, American Lung Association is, uh, you know, grades air quality. <laughs> oh, is that the air filter? There you go. Your show and tell. Yeah, it's black. Yeah, that's, that's pretty icky. And that, that's frequent changing. Um, Connecticut gets a, a, you know, they, and they do it, they break it down by county and Connecticut gets a grade of, of F. And people just, I think, assume that it's not, you know, my air is pretty good, but actually pretty much across the state, the, the uh, air quality is pretty bad. So, all right, let's see. I think, um, let me look at the chat. Um, Steve, you're welcome to unmute yourself. I guess you actually have, um, a bit more uh, to say about the uh, bipolar. Um, yes, I, I, I've been looking at this carefully. Uh, there are two firms, uh, one in particular, Global Plasma. Um, I forget the what the uh, it's GSI, I think. But there's another firm called Air, uh, Active Air Solutions that I met about 20 years ago, and they were very active in Connecticut and then moved down to South Carolina because they weren't getting much tra traction up here. But they've had a great track record in schools down in the, in the South in installing their bipolar systems. And if you do some research on that, there, there's a, uh, a video that I saw. Maybe, maybe it's all you know, a hype, I don't think so, but the ASHRAE has actually come out with a, a standard of measurement and it, it has been tested uh, on viruses and it apparently is about 99% effective in, in killing them. And the original purpose of the bipolar was simply before COVID came on the line in a big way was to filter out particulates in, in the air. So what William or Bill just talked about uh, with bipolar would, it would be intercepted. All those particulate matters would be intercepted by bipolar. And uh, it, according to what the research says is that bipolar will actually increase the effectiveness of your filters by about five points. Hmm. So I would just say, I wouldn't dismiss it out of hand as he did. I would say it deserves a really good look. Hmm. Uh, um, um, we're probably going to install it in a building in Portchester that I'm working on. That's all. Hmm. Interesting. Stephen, I would just, I would just put out there, I've heard from a lot of engineers that they've looked into these claims in more detail and asked them more specifically what effectiveness does this actual thing have in its particular application as opposed to um, as it's you know tested in a lab and actually the effectiveness is much lower if you look at it and in actually installed in a system so i just would would caveat that you should ask them to actually stand by their mm -hmm. claims for what how you're actually going to install it and the other thing I would note is that filtration works very effectively. We know that. So um, I, the first, the first, you know, um, barrier or the first thing that you should do is do filtration before adding on these much more technologically uh, innovative and potentially not as effective solutions. Yeah. Okay. Good point. Hmm. And and UV has also been effective. Right. That's true too. Okay. UV, you just have to make sure that, you know, it has to it has to be in contact with the air for a certain amount of time. So filtration works is, you know, you just have to make sure that it's gasketed correctly, that there's no bypass, there's no air bypass, but the UV, you also have to make sure that first of all, there's nobody that's exposed to it, you know, cause it can be, um, harmful to people if it's if it's you're directly exposed to it and you have to make sure that it is in contact with the air for the amount of time that it needs to be for it to be effective all right all right really good questions thanks thanks steve for for bringing that up um does anybody else have any, um, any, I don't know, any, was anyone else surprised by anything, you know, and I appreciate Steve, you know, kind of, you know, calling out something because, because I always think the same thing, you know, what, what was I surprised by or what didn't I expect? And um, 
So does anyone else have any uh, comments or observations about anything that John shared? Or, you know, it would be nice if I knew, you know, or, or interest in understanding any other aspects a little better or any comments on the book, if you happen to read it. This is Chris again. I wish I could play with that modeling <laughs> spreadsheet that he has. That is so interesting and being able to see exactly how, I've got an MBA, I've got, I've, I've taken finance courses and being able to, to play with it in that sort of a context makes it so much easier to envision and to make the case and to really try to make the decisions of do I do this? What's gonna be the payoff? What's the internal rate of return for one investment over another? It's fantastic. I'm really hoping that <laughs> someday he puts out some kind of just fun, easy tool that people can use. Yeah. You know, it's funny when you when you read the book and, you know, he, he did cut there's there's a lot in the book and he gives a lot of examples. And I think, you know, up front, he was talking about um, the classic approach has been to look at operational savings from energy and sort of looking at return on investment. And what he you know, you know, when when they look at it or they look at it a little differently, that basically was what he was saying is you know, that's such a minute uh, percentage of the actual uh, financial picture for a building. And so that's where he sort of said right up front, you know, I think we've been chasing the wrong, you know, the wrong tail. And um, the metric that, that they really use or recommend using is cash flow. And it's when you then factor in these either uh, avoided cost and or productivity gains um, you can then start to, uh, you know, build sort of a case for a pro forma PL where you actually then look at cash flow. And I think that, you know, that's a very, very different perspective on making the business case for uh, a healthy building. And what I thought was interesting, and again, you know, we didn't have time to really get into it, but when you look at affordable housing or public housing, you know, the, the metrics are a little different, obviously, because you don't have the same rent structure. You know, you're not charging a premium for rent, for example, or you're not looking at productivity gains. But when you start to look at, um, you know, uh, less visits to the ER room from people suffering from, um, you know, uh, poor indoor air quality, for example, is, is one example, um, you know, that there's a cost to that that the state bears. And you know it, it would it would be like you said, Chris. If I'd like to see the spreadsheet where we could play around with those you know those those toggles, because for me that's really would make a really compelling case for why it's not just about how much does it cost to build a building like this, but really what are what are the other costs and or savings that um, when you look at the, the bigger picture. It, it's interesting. I I did. Uh... 10 years ago, I did a major re renovation of the Princeton Club in New York, and we saved them 50% on their energy uh, consumption, which was pretty substantial, $500,000 a year on a 50,000 square foot building. Um, however, I did a whole presentation, I think it was for the board or the membership or whatever, and it illustrated, although it wasn't really particularly relevant to uh, uh, the nonprofit like the Princeton Club, it did highlight what lead information was coming out at that time about the increase in, in building value of having a healthy building. So, I mean, this stuff has been around for a long time. It's just that the real estate market just said, eh, we're not interested, I mean, you know. And I'm, I'm awfully glad that he has done the work that he's done that in, you know, with his spreadsheets and, and data and everything else, which makes it crystal clear. And hopefully people will listen now. Yeah, definitely agreed. I, right. I think it's going to be very interesting if I can just take one more second. Yeah. Um, he, it, what kind of um, compensation models are going to be happening um, since he, he brought up and it's very, it seems to be pretty common that energy upgrades, energy efficiency upgrades rather, are often the payout is over the savings, you know, or it, the, the savings is the main um, impetus for, for for securing the funding, for, for calculating the internal rate of return. 
And if we're realizing that it's not how much you save, it's more the overall effect. I'm, I'm just, I'll be curious to see what kind of financial models come out of that mm. in order to make the case for these upgrades that absolutely should be happening for things that are as intangible in many respects as indoor air quality or ambiance or aesthetics or any of these things if we're not necessarily only looking at what the cost saving will be. Right. Well, for a lot, yeah, for a lot of these companies, it's a lot about attracting and retaining talent. So mm. even if they don't see the specific productivity gains, what they do see is that they're able to, um, you know, retain and attract talent, and especially when it comes to you know, high tech industries. Um, so for instance, like Etsy, the Etsy headquarters has a, um, some great like biophilia measures. Um, they did um, living building challenge certification on, for materials. Um, and Google has, has used these health, they've been doing a lot of really awesome health monitoring and uh, to kind of quantify the effects of biophilic interventions. Um, so I, there's definitely, there's definitely interest um, I think COVID definitely might have thrown a wrench in there with a lot more people working from home than in their office, but um, it's pretty exciting stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. I think just the, the fact that, you know, everyone is so much more aware of this, as Steve said, you know, some of this stuff isn't necessarily new thinking, but a lot more people are paying attention. And, um, and that's encouraging. Um, Kathy Faye, I really appreciate uh, your comment that you just made. She said that the Governor's Council on Climate Change has been advancing the recommendation that public health benefits of energy upgrades be factored into the decision-making processes regarding residential sectors. And, um, and I actually was talking to somebody today from the Yale School of Public Health, and uh, she was saying that, you know, I didn't, I wasn't aware of this, that, you know, public, public health now has, has a seat at the table, so to speak, with the GC3 working groups. And I was really encouraged to hear that because it, to me, that makes so much sense, but it's just, you know, bringing health into this um, hasn't necessarily been there from the beginning. So um, it's pretty encouraging. Just to add one, one more thing, I, I, I used to do guest lectures using the Princeton Club as an example for the uh, Shack Institute at NYU. And we bring the students over and portion of, of the club uh, where we had uh, the major renovations had a brand new air handling system. And another portion did not. We hadn't gotten around to doing that yet. <clears throat> it was like, we, we take them into the old section first and say, what do you think? And it was stuffy and it was, Ugh. and then we go into the new section. It was like, suddenly we had walked into the harbor. We had a sea breeze going. I mean, it was so dramatically different, you know? Yeah, it's cool. All right. Any other, any other thoughts or questions? We're feeling good. We've covered the terrain. That's excellent. Well, um, thank you everyone for, for uh, attending and participating. Um, we'll be putting this recording on our website so you can go back and stare at John's uh, spreadsheets uh, to your heart's delight. And um, as I said, I, I encourage you to pick up the book. I've, I've gotten a lot out of, out of reading it. There's, it's, it's just jam packed with a lot of examples and, and quite a few pro formas if you're, if you're into seeing um, kind of different examples of how to apply, apply the math and make the business case for healthy buildings. And I think towards the end of the book, he actually gets into um, the, you know, actually factoring in a climate change impacts, which again is uh, another part of this. Uh, that's a whole other session. So thanks again for coming and um, have, a, have a great night. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Kathy.